challenge national security systems. So this is me, some of my, uh, that's why I work, Black Box Network Services. Uh, for some of you who, who, uh, uh, who know Black Box, yes, it's, it's the same catalog. Um, I do business risk and uh, some associated services as well. Um, the Geek started really early with me, and this is not going to translate well. It's supposed to be here, but it's all right. Um, so, a, a brief little bit about me uh, and my background and, and why I'm here talking. Um, I, uh, I had a really interesting opportunity when I was in college, uh, in the early 90s. I, I went to Case Western in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. In my senior year, I had the opportunity to do an internship with this guy uh, who had this company that at the time was developing antibodies. Uh, his name was Dr. Peter Tippett. And some of you may know that name at this point, but Dr. Peter Tippett uh, has since become, I think he's the chief medical officer of Verizon. But, but um, long story short, from these beginnings where I started in InfoSec in 1991-92, um, we were disassembling virus code. We got, uh, at the time, we were getting about 15 to 20 new viruses in uh, to disassemble per week. And this is 91, 92. Right. So, um, essentially then what happens, you know, luck would have it, that is my intro to uh, I, I, um Dr. Peter Tippett sold the company that we were, um, that I was employed at, called Service International to Symantec, and a lot of our work became some of the core of more than analytics, some semantic analytics. Um, I founded my own company doing pen testing and all this other stuff, um, and I, I had the opportunity to come over to Blackbox to um, develop at the time uh, a, you know, a real security uh, practice where um, you know, we're not talking about, and, and I'll kind of touch upon this as we go through some of these, some of these slides, but, you know, firewalls are not security from my perspective, that's more of the infrastructure. Um, but, you know, the bottom line here, though, uh, and I'll, I'll go through a couple of disclaimers, right, I think obviously it represents my employers. Um, this is not a box popper talk, it's not a cool to talk. Um, and it's focused on natural security systems. Now, when I say that, the, the biggest disclaimer here is that this is not about Darwinian evolution versus religion, so let's just get that out of our minds right now. Uh, this is about natural adaptation, and I expect arguments. So, let's get into this. There are a number of generic problems with InfoSec. <clears throat> So, so information security functionally, um, you know, it, it, it today is really viewed as a tactical solution, which is inherently reactive. We, as an industry, and in order to protect our client data and allow them to take risks so they can be innovative, InfoSec really needs to be accepted as a business function. It's inherent all of our organizations as a business function. That's where it should be. Um, I'm not going to go through the demo, but we'll just keep moving on here. So, let's talk about InfoSec's role real quick, and then I'll kind of get into the meat and potatoes here. Right? We have to prevent the loss of our business credit rate. Yeah, that's fairly good. Uh, promoting innovation. Our job is really to, to allow our organizations to take more risks so they can innovate more, and then you know be more successful over the competition, etc. All of that directly ties into national economies, right? So we have a large job, uh, but and and, I'm, and then protecting the brain. Right? We have the brain. Our problems, though, are what are these business initiatives and goals, right? <clears throat> Where what is the organization's business critical data? You know, let's do some IT calisthenics and raise your hands here. How many people know? what your organization's business critical data actually is. A couple, a few, right? <clears throat> How about those of you who do know that, do you know where it lives? A couple, a couple few? Sure about that? Just check, right? But 
that's a core problem for InfoSec today. And, and, and as we kind of take into this, you know, as we take into account these types of um, these types of problems, who else might find value in that business critical data is an absolute essential variable in order for us to understand the threat models and be able to, you know, feasibly protect the, you know the data itself. This is my this is the standard FUD slide. Shit is about to fall on everybody and APT and whatever um, indicators of compromise. Things of that nature, right? But as we are, no offense to our sponsors, but as we are kind of inundated by a lot of that FUD, what are our organizational reactions, right? Organizationally, we're buying, we're buying more blinky lights, right? Hack back. Ugh. Legislation? I mean, uh, this point here is really tied into that legislation, which is if we've gotten to the point where we have to legislate our problems, we've completely missed the problem to begin with, right? And, and, and the irony is all of this business big business arrogance that is fueling, you know, the response from the FUD and the investment in all these blinky lights and things of that nature are creating even more revenue generating businesses, successful businesses. You know, this is not a new story. But the, the, the biggest problem here is that because it's not a new story, like, like what Jack was saying earlier today, why aren't we learning? How can we learn? Right. So, what does this problem attempt to solve? Well, this um, this is a Gartner uh, spend IT spend in trillions over the past five years, right? and you know there's a little anomaly here and there, but basically IT spend has gone up in trillions. And this is the Verizon DBIR over the last five years. And guess what? You know, sure, there's a little anomaly here and there, but those breaches continue to go up. So we're investing in all this stuff. How much of an effect are we really having with all this investment? Anyone? <clears throat> Most people in the industry who are who are in that innovative kind of um, I don't know if you know David Kennedy, I'm sure many of you do, but uh, he's a really, really smart guy. Uh, he's author of the social engineering toolkit, he's one of these cats who you know, read, readily admits that we in the information security vertical are most likely a good two years behind the technical innovations that are incentivized by organized crime and nation state. Right? We're two years behind. And that's scary. <laughs> so the second problem that this talk is attempting to solve is our obsession with staff models. Okay? And, and, and we call it the problem with walls. And the problem with walls is that, like anything else, you know, let's say it's a dam or a dike or a levee, right? Its, it's static purpose is to prevent water from going from point A to point B, but over time, there's a natural kind of adaptation of water that will eventually kind of get around. Static controls are static controls and there's no, there's no dynamic anything with static controls, and that's a problem. <clears throat> Organizational entropy. Third point that we're going to talk about, and, and hope maybe, maybe we can, you know, instill something. But organizational entropy, first of all, is one of my favorite terms. It's, it's so elegant. Organizational entropy is the natural result of assuming you're smarter than your adversary. And if you are in that position, in that mindset, there's no incentive to learn and to get out of your comfort zone. And I'll talk about getting out of, your, out of our comfort zone as we kind of move in through this, because that's critical to natural adaptation. <clears throat> and then finally, this, this unnatural state of our businesses. And, and when I say unnatural state, the There's this mentality, right, that 
essentially organization, um, because this learning is, because there's literally no learning, right? Our organizations are staying inside their comfort zones, okay? What do we call that? Business as usual, right? So, in order to really kind of learn, have our organizations learn, we have to get out of this mindset that this natural state that we're in, which is really unnatural, and our organizations must learn to adapt, get out of their comfort zone, in order to effectively attempt to protect against these, these adversarial uh, te you know, te technology techniques, whatever, that we're already a couple of years behind, right? And the, the, the solution is not buying all this stuff over here. The solution is really kind of here from a people perspective. <clears throat> so these are the problems that, that you know, from a goal perspective, I'm trying to, you know, let's let's see if we can let's see if we can get some ideas around this stuff. But as as I go through this, there's one there's one thing that's nagging at me. Is it even feasible to convince any organizational like, you know, can we modify our organization's behavior without blatantly going to the people who are a profiting and, and you know making money and being successful, right? The CEOs, the CIOs, the CFOs, and say, guess what? You're doing it wrong, right? So let's see. Um, our we're having a really difficult time securing all this business critical data. Our organizations are continuing to make money and you know target, right? Guess how, guess where the target stock price is now? Back to where it was. Right, the revenue, the, the profits down still, but we have short memories. <clears throat> but can we? Is it feasible to go and say to to be able to change our organizational kind of makeup and behavior without trying to dismantle the way either bottom up or top down, you know, managerially, our our, our organizations are, are constructed? And I say, yes, we can. Have. I do believe that it is possible, and and through these techniques, um, techniques, techniques, I, I read a lot. A lot of this stuff that we we'll kind of go through is is you know just me taking things from here and there and saying, hey, we can apply. But here's my positive: naturally adaptive systems are inherently more secure. Okay, there are these. Yeah, getting ahead of myself. Take a <laughs> As we go through, um, as we go through this, I, I would very, very highly recommend these three books. Okay, uh, *Emergence* by Stephen Johnson. It's the connected lives of ants, brains, cities, and software. *The Wisdom of Crowds* by James Surowiecki. Um, it was a fantastic read, and I'll, I'll kind of go through a couple of examples. Uh, and then learning from the octopus, which is phenomenal, and I'm going to take, I'm going to steal a ton of his content. Um, that guy was a, he's a, bi a natural biologist who was in uh, politics for a number of years, and, and and a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in terms of how can we naturally kind of treat our organizations as organisms and learn how organisms adapt and apply that to our organizations because. When we break it, when we break it all down, organizations are made up of little parts here and there, just like organisms. So there's collaboration, there's cooperation, and, and all of that, you know, will, in my opinion, assist in making our organizations more naturally secure. <clears throat> so there's a number of rules of engagement here, right? When we talk about naturally adaptive systems. <coughs> Naturally adaptive systems are organized semi-autonomously with little central control. Decentralization. Decentralization is a very, very touchy topic, especially when we're in, we're in a business conversation. Right? Um, learning from your success. There's this, there's this old adage, learn, you know, learn from your failures. That's a very incorrect statement. Learn from your successes. The same way 
a lot of people believe that uh, uh, survival of the fittest is the Darwin, you know, mantra. Well, that's actually incorrect as well. It's actually survival of the good enough. Right? If you're good enough at outrunning the tiger, you're going to survive. You don't have to be the best sprinter on the planet. Right? <clears throat> Using information to mitigate uncertainty. Well, mitigating uncertainty is a very, very interesting topic in itself because that's really what we are trying to do as information security professionals, is to mitigate uncertainty. Right? We actually also want to instill a level of uncertainty at our adversaries, right? So honeypots or intrusion detection, anything that will make them maybe not be as confident as they as as they might be in trying to gain you know gain access to your business critical data. But uncertainty is definitely a, a, a big big variable in, in all of this naturally adaptive talk. Um, and then. Uh, Engaging in diverse symbiotic relationships, right? So that could be at any level of the organization, whether or not we're talking about intra-organizational. So, oh, to your question, yeah. absolutely. Uh, to say use information to mitigate uncertainty, but a lot of the other bullet points emphasize your ability to adapt. Would your ability to adapt uh, be sort of the primary way of mitigating uncertainty? For example, like, kind of, kind of, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So, for example, let's say. Let's example of how some of that was utilized. There are other examples, you know, at the other end of that spectrum, you know, that contribute to naturally adaptive systems. But as we kind of go through this, I think a lot of it will make sense, right? Adaptation arises when you are, when you either get out of your comfort zone or you're pushed out of your comfort zone. And in those instances, learning is absolutely one of the one of the biggest variables here. Adding any of the, you know, again, this this is not adaptation. This is not adapting. Right? These <clears throat> techniques start with these decentralized and distributed organisms or organisms or organizations. Right? And within there, the benefits include multiple sensors. All right, so within InfoSec, we, we deal with a lot of sensors, right? So whether it's intrusion detection sensors, and, you know, or, or net flow sensors or, or whatnot. Um, but multiple sensors with no preconceived notions. No preconceived notions means that there's no mandate, there's no direction, okay? There's no commands, right? The wisdom of crowds is, is basically taking a, a sample set of people and putting them, giving them a challenge and putting them, just letting them go out and, 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 and trying to find the best solution for that challenge, okay? So, with no preconceived notions, <clears throat> multiple sensors, within that, you know, within our sample set of, of people who have this challenge, right, we have 
um, individuals with specialized tasks or organize, organizations with specialized tasks, organisms, etc. It's all interchangeable. Redundancy, we obviously all here, you know, understand the value of redundancy, right? So, the requirement of a challenge. This is the second big point, right? Again, I, I, I really want to emphasize that the lack of having mandates and, and, and you know, this has to be done this way, and I, I want to make sure that this, you know, this command is is, is taken, you know, through to, to finish. That's not how successful adaptation works, right? What happens here is challenges within an organization instill competition. Competition between the parts, right? You know, and, and, and you know, the same thing with organisms, right? Organisms are competing for, let's say, food, and then at some point, all of the little smaller parts and pieces realize that they have the same goal. And that competition then instills collaboration and cooperation, right, at a very small part. <clears throat> so when that happens, there's a, there's all, in, in successful adaptation uh, examples, there's this domino effect where, okay, here's this little area here and all of its little pieces and parts figured out that we're going for the same you know, the same goal in this challenge, and now we're cooperating. Well, now there's a whole different area over here. Let's say it's a different business unit or a different set of organisms, right? With, with also, so now there's competition between these larger areas of the organism or organization, and at some point, in the, you know, when they learn that the goals are all the same, then now they're cooperating, collaborating, and on and on and on. <clears throat> um, there's a really great example in, in the Wisdom of Crowds book about, does anybody know what the USS Scorpion was? It was a nuclear submarine that was lost. Yeah, it was the only American nuclear submarine that was ever lost, right? So at the time when this went down, the head of the Navy, and I'm going to but, butcher the story because I don't remember his name, but the head of the Navy issued a challenge without, throughout the entire department of the Navy, everybody from custodians to you know rear admirals, and and basically said, okay, given what we know, we knew we know the last point of you know they were in the they were in the Atlantic. We know the last radio transmission location. We know the wind direction. We know this and that and that. Given this, given these variables, give me your everybody individually, right? Give me your best case. What you think happened and where you think that so is now, right? And you know they, they they got all the results and nobody had anything spot on. But when they took the mean of all of these hundreds, maybe even a thousand answers, the 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 actual location of the sub once they find it, once they found it, was 224 yards from where the mean of the, of the crowd figured it out. You know, said it was going to. Right? That's mind blowing. <clears throat> but it illustrates this is a challenge, and this is how we can utilize this type of, you know, this type of thought to begin working together and, 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 and enhancing the security of our organizations. Information sharing, filtering, and prioritization. Right. So it's obviously sharing is essential, you know, from from an organizational from an organizational perspective, and organisms tend to seek to reduce the uncertainty for themselves, like we talked about, and increase the uncertainty for their adversaries. Symbiosis. Real quick on symbiosis, because I know we're going to run a little late here. Um, but there are different types of symbiosis, and I'll have these slides up, because I know this is not the best type thing here. But, um, but the, the, the really the big point from a uh, symbiosis perspective is that it creates reactions that are more than just the sum of two organ organisms working together. Symbiosis, uh, from a you know from a business perspective, from an organization perspective, you know is 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 critical is critical to this whole competition and cooperation. Right. So um, again. The competition leads to group cooperation. Group cooperation increases the effectiveness against adversarial threat. And then 
um, competition leads to group, the group competitions lead to group cooperation. This is how all of this builds and builds and builds. But here's the point, right? <clears throat> What's the incentive? What's the incentive for us to change this behavior? What's the incentive for our business leaders to say, you know something, we're doing it wrong. We're making money, that's wrong, right? <clears throat> What's the incentive? Business as usual comfort zones are always going to basically you're going to remain in your comfort zone. You can't learn and you can't adapt until you get out of your comfort zone, right? So, incentivized adversarial innovation, right? And this is what we are all up against. This, this incentivized adversarial uh, technology, right? This is the APTs and all of that stuff. This is a big business. There's, there, we do a lot of trending and work with a lot of organizations like you know, the Bureau and whatnot, and, uh, just kind of like data sharing and, and mining and whatnot. And a lot of these organizations have seven-figure R&D budgets for malware research, right? This is a business. Make no mistake about it, right? There's lots of profit. There's lots of margin. And... <clears throat> And there's lots of ways to now incentivize the development of this type of technology that is, that is you know, coming against our controls to try to breach our systems and get our business critical data, right? We're not doing a lot of that on the, let's call it, defensive you know, portion of, of, of our organization, right? So how can we build more naturally secured systems in an environment where our business leaders are not really going to be <coughs> acceptable at all, or accepting at all, of any types of changes within the organization like this. But we recognize that it's absolutely necessary if we are have any, if we want to have, excuse me, any chance of further keeping our business you know, innovations and, and business critical data to ourselves. <clears throat> but wait. Aren't we, aren't we humans good at, at, at adapting, right? Um, sure, absolutely. But there's the contradiction is while we are human, you know, while, while we humans are good at adaptation, right? There's there's all of what we've created. All these systems are just are, have been um, created that are non-adaptable organizations. Um, again, the, this is the problem with the business as usual, right? We're not getting out of our comfort zones. And because we're not doing that, we end up with systems that are completely static, right? This is the problem with walls, static systems, static mentality, and, and no real incentive to kind of get out of our comfort zones. So how do we then <coughs> get systems within organizations that can deal with security problems organically and naturally. The basis, again, introducing challenges within your organizations, okay? No directives, no mandates, it's, it's the challenge mentality. Amplify and reward success. Um, the, um, uh, uh, I know a lot of organizations now are really kind of diving into um, more successful security awareness programs where there's, they're incentivizing the populace, the, user, the users of the organization, when, let's say, um, somebody walks up to the, uh, to the front gate and wants to come in and, 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 and you know, has a, hey, I, I want to give my resume to you guys, I'm looking for a job, here's a, here's a thumb drive, can you, you know, just, just copy it to your system, no, no worries, right? Incentivize all that. that you know, that's, that's an example of <clears throat> something that should be, um, should be, um, I'm blanking on the word, uh, just announced throughout the organization. That's a really, really good incentive. Um, taking advantage of the localized problem solvers and promoting learning, the cooperation, the symbiosis. So, who, who here? 
has anything to do from, a, let's say, a, a, you know, within the IT community, any um, responsibility from a, a, you know, let's say, a team leadership or, or or management or anything like that? Do you contribute to teams within your organization that have? Uh, you know, that, who, who's a team leader? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> right. But how many also think that, that these types of changes are too radical for your organization? <laughs> but why? Why would why would we think like that? Right? Um, and and I absolutely agree from the perspective that look, if we were to it's not feasible to go to the people that run your company and say, hey, let's try this. This isn't working, right? <clears throat> but this is, this is what I would like to then posit as the challenge from me to you, right? This is my challenge of, of the natural security, the adaptive process. Take these ideas and see if you can, at a very small, at, at very small parts of your organization, apply that. Right? And, and, and begin thinking in terms of this challenge, competition, cooperation, incentivization. Naturally, your team members, the, the parts of your organization, are going to learn from, you know, learn from their successes and begin to, at a human level, be, uh, essentially get us more secure, naturally secure institutions and organizations. Your small successes will lead to bigger successes. And those bigger successes will then ensure, not ensure, nothing's obviously you know, 100%, but will greatly go towards the, the more naturally, naturally securing your businesses without having to, you know, in, rely on the heavy investment of the latest APT protection application for our clients. Good question. Well, I was thinking about this, so I think the issue is when you are in IT, it feels easier to change technology than it is behavior. And there and therefore in their specialty is the is tech. Do you follow what you know? And I think it's a challenge if you are in security, to think about behavior rather than as a policy driven uh, thought points rather than trying to add new tech. Mm -hmm. But new tech is easy and usually doesn't get you fired. <laughs> you, hit, you hit it right in the head, right? And, and, and what, what, what am I talking about? Right? Yeah, that's, it's hard to try to make that happen, but guess what? Get out of your comfort zone. Right? You know, that's the challenge. That's why this is a challenge of the challenge of natural security systems. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard to even begin starting to have these conversations. But in my mind, it makes a hell of a lot of sense. And, and if, we can, if we can begin to secure our organizations using this type of mentality, right, and, and, and understand that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it's all about our people, right, then I think we have a much more probable probability of success to, but look, at the end of the day, we, from a blue team role perspective, our job is to delay the amount of time it takes from some, somebody to try to breach our protective countermeasures and gain access to, right, it's a, it's a game of time, okay, and if we can, through these types of techniques, and, you know, and, and build upon the, the build upon the, the structure that we already have from an infrastructure perspective in these types of controls. Um, that gives us a really, really good, good uh, step ahead of our adversaries, uh, especially when we, when we talk about this. You know, really, it's the human side of all of this. <clears throat> so, I, you know, really kind of in, in closing, if we can accomplish this, <clears throat> all without telling the CEO that he's not that he, He's done his job wrong, right? Um, and I think that's a success in my mind. So um, that's that's my feedback. That's my presentation. Any, um, yeah, I, I welcome feedback, arguments, etc. Yes.
So it looks like basically what you described about the existing state of affairs is we are essentially building a, a rather static uh, defense where essentially we build our own corpus, we're sitting it inside it, and some, somehow I can't seem to figure out the world's entire military history of anyone who ever wanted to want the battle. Sure. Uh, also, I can't seem to think by that uh, throughout the entire military history of no, so far, uh, I can't seem to think of anyone who has, has ever won the war by being on the defensive. Absolutely. Is, uh, so, okay, but is, there, I, I is that been. is that a promotion for a halfback mentality? You know, like, no, I don't. How do you? By, go, by going on the offensive, I don't necessarily mean stupidly. Let's go and hack them back. That doesn't have to necessarily be the instrument. You can stay. Uh, you can. It doesn't have to be necessarily technical. You can find out who your attacker is and use uh, other measures. How like easy is that to do today on the internet, finding who your attacker is? Well, there's, there's some ways of finding that out. It's not necessarily easy, uh, but in some cases it may be doable. Sure. And you may apply pressure on it the it, it, it also, side of the It also depends on what you have, right? What vertical you have, your what your, you know, there is a certain level. It, nation state, uh, nation state adversaries are not going to go after K through 12, you know, kindergarten schools, right? So they're not. I mean, you know, what's the incentive, right? Going after intellectual property, going after you know medical research and all that stuff. Stuff that stuff that makes a difference. Yeah, stuff, stuff that makes a difference. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So there's new laws here from uh, the SEC about sustainable and sustainable costs for an IT hack. You can go to jail if you don't report what your costs are sure. for an IP loss. Can you talk about that? I don't know much about the, the latest. I mean, we could talk about adversarial you know, cyber war, but this is a real law. Yeah. You can go to jail. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't, I don't have much insight into that specific ruling at all. Um, you know, but the bottom line is, from an adversarial perspective, there's an ROI, right? Uh, Josh Corman talks about adversary ROI, right? And while security ROI is really kind of a, a mythical bullshit topic, right? There's no, we're talking about risk, and you can't have an ROI on risk. But what you can kind of closely more quantify is an adversary ROI, right? They have a budget just like we do, and so if we can get an understanding of that adversary's capabilities, and be able to utilize maybe these techniques or other systems to then, you know, delay the time that it takes them to try to get your data. That at some point can reduce their ROI to the point where it's probably not worth it. Well, that's exactly the, the point here. The SEC is asked to have you define what the cost is for your own intellectual property loss. Right. Now, if you're a software company, you can do that in terms of what the value of the IP code was, right? For other companies, I mean, it's a lot more. It's a lot more complex. No, absolutely. I absolutely agree. I work with organizations that um, that they actually don't patent a lot of their stuff because guess what? All that stuff's public information, right? So if their if their competition in China wants to you know spin up a, a, a some factory to do exactly what they're doing but at a third of the cost, they can just go to the they can have somebody you know maybe plant it or whatever go to the patent office and, and say, okay, there it is. That's how they did it. Um, um, so it's, I see it as a very sticky situation, obviously, what you're talking about. Uh, and I'd love to talk about it more, but any other final, any other final questions, comments? Am I out of my mind? Yes. I really like the comfort zone. It strikes me for the inner, the idea of a village and Everybody who's eaten by a lion has actually been hunting outside the village, <coughs> but everybody who stopped to death, stopped to death inside the village in their comfort zone. <laughs> I like it. Can I use it? Go for it. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.